By Tillet, Thatched, Commercial. We're your high street insurance brokers for all types of insurance. Avoid faceless internet firms. High house insurance, do it face to face. See Neil and the friendly team at High Street Selsey. High house insurance, do it face to face. Or call Selsey 606 552. This is Salesy Internet Radio. I'm Emma Corley. Later I'll be telling you what's on in Salesy and the surrounding area in the next week. Also this week's podcast has an interview with Kylie Scott, Salesy News, Salesy's new youth worker, who will be talking about her new role at Snack Shack and Youth Dream. We also have an interview with Eddie Saunders, the owner and publisher of Salesy Life magazine. Eddie is about to publish the 150th edition and Hugh Graham will ask Eddie why he launched the magazine all those years ago and about its success 15 years on. Also this week we have two new regular items. Firstly, Lynn Reeve who runs Toppany Rice in the High Street will be sharing recipes that Granny used to make. This week she's telling us how to put the crunch into pickled onions and later on Giles Pear will be talking to Hugh Graham about what needs to be done in the October Garden. And let's not forget our usual slot with our local author Ellis Berg. Now let's get on with our first interview. I'm Hugh Graham, I'm in the Snack Shack and I'm talking to a charming young lady called Kylie Scott. Hello. Kylie, what are you doing here? I've been employed as a sales youth worker. Fine. So when did you start? Four weeks ago. What do you think of Celsius Youth then? Are they all scallywags or do you see some hope for them? There's hope. There is hope. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how are you going about discovering them or letting them discover you? I'm going to go into their schools and, uh, and I work at Snack Shack two nights a week. So how are you finding the Snack Shack? It's good. It's growing every week. We started off with seven young people and our last night we had 25. Really? And what age groups are coming in? Age groups 12 to 14, 15. Yeah. So when will you get the older kids in? I don't know. I'd, I've got to go up the skate park and find them. Or okay. I've got to find them. I don't know where they are. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping to make links in the school yeah. at the youth wing to uh, work with Year 11s. Okay. So who's funding you? I get funded from Snack Shack for 20 hours and Youth Dream for 10 hours. Okay, so this is not uh, fun, being, being funded at all by the local authorities? No, but... So how did that come about? Uh, statutory youth provisions have been cut, so with the cuts to the counter councils, youth work has been reduced, but the money's still there so people can apply for grants. And that's exactly what Snack Shack and... So the local authorities haven't turned their back on youth work then? They're just funding it a different way? They used to employ full-time youth workers and they no longer do that. So they have people in place to guide voluntary sectors so that they can get advice in their recruitment and their terms and conditions and then it's up to local people to employ youth workers themselves. Okay. Uh, Which is what's happening now? Yes, it was a so long process. But you're, yes. you're self-employed and you're on a contract? I'm employed for six months. Yeah. There's talk of three months extra. Yeah. and uh, So yeah, there are grants coming in. Yeah. So my, yeah, my role will be secured. But the aim is to have a three-year contract. Okay. And are you happy with that, are you? If I get a contract, yes. Okay. <laughs> so what do you... What is it, what, how are you actually meeting the kids? Are you go to the schools? Yes, I used to be a uh, school in inclusions worker where I worked with disaffected young people yeah. aged 15 and 16, probably, in the, well, it was year 11s, at risk of leaving school with no qualifications. So we got a group together, and because it was a city, we did have a group of 14, and we were able to engage them in informal education and accreditation which resulted in them being able to access college or apprenticeships or employment, but rarely employment. There aren't many jobs for young people aged 16. 
So would you be going to uh, talk to kids at the at, at schools other than the academy? Would you be going to the two primary schools? Yes, I'm going to do a democracy day. I'm working with... What's a democracy day? Just to try and um, reach those young people that perhaps aren't into sport or drama and, and perhaps are a little bit politically minded or want to understand how you can have your voice heard. Right. Well, I was in, involved briefly or slightly with the when the Snack Chat was established and it was basically set up as a sort of catering van in Budgeon's car park and somewhat to my astonishment I found that the kids were, would gather round that van like moths round the flame mm -hmm. and it was right throughout the really cold winter they were playing that ball and doing all sorts of things and enjoying the cups of tea and coffee and so on. These kids appeared to be lost, they had nowhere to go and they, they really were so thrilled to have this provision on Monday and Tuesday, they, kept, they couldn't understand why why grown-ups were doing it when they weren't getting paid because they offered to work there for money mm. and when they discovered there was no money they said well why are you doing it mm. so what do you think i think if we think about how our young people are governed and controlled from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed there's lots of hours in the day where they're required or they're known about so sometimes when young people get their own space to be who they want to be and just hang out with their mates. I mean, after all, you know, they might get a break time or a lunch time, mm -hmm. but even so, that's in a school environment. So that's what I like about the Snack Shack and the idea that it's a drop-in where young people can be themselves, meet their friends with no requirement. I don't have to tick any boxes. I don't have to... Yeah, there's no, there's no targets. It's just allowing young people to be who they are, talk amongst themselves, and, and maybe subtly, over time, challenge their attitudes and behaviours and, and perhaps, you know, in time, make them realise, yeah, their opportunities, create opportunities, but ultimately to keep a safe space for young people to, to hang out. And when they come in here, because I've only been here or briefly in the evening and normally at an adult function what do the kids actually do here i don't know what they used to do but since i've been here um i've engaged them in conversation which they quite like we <laughs> huddle around and i say what we're going to talk about um and lately we've been playing cards yeah so yeah and i, I suspect as the weather gets a bit grim we'll have more young people in but they're, they're asking to play games so they're interacting are you getting any kids who go to any of the Chichester schools? There, there is uh, two, yeah, two or three that go to the girls' school, yeah. yeah okay, and uh, because uh, an awful lot of the Celtic boys will go to Bishop Luffer, for example, and to the and to the high school. Right. So because uh, O levels stop at the academy and they go on to higher education, mm -hmm. either at the college or or, or 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 at the high school, so. How are you going to capture them, or will they, hopefully, a word of mouth will... will I, th I think that's, that's something that we're going to work with Sam Tate from the Town Hall, mm -hmm. um, and it's looking at the barriers that are for young people, um, where there is no sixth form, that they will have to travel out of Selsey to get further education, and with that, careers, uh, advice and guidance. So... The, there's a building that's going to be used for young people to access uh, job opportunities or career advice or CV building. Or, okay. So we're going to help with that. But uh, that's a project that they have got a grant to do. So that's one to look out for, for their 16 to 19 year olds who are possible NEET. You might hear that word, which is not in education, training or employment. Yeah. So it's capturing those young people before they become lost in the system really how easy is it for a young person to get lost very well there's just a multitude of factors that can affect how they're treated by their peers how they feel in their families there might be a breakdown of family there might be a breakdown of it um ex uh, extended family there people. might be bereavement you know it just there's there's so many factors and some some young people have a multitude of factors that affect them and sometimes i mean 
I'm not talking about sales of young people necessarily, it's only from no. my previous, is that actually, um, yeah, for a young person to turn up to school is a really good achievement. The fact that they can't concentrate in class has nothing to do with it. The fact that they're there is, a, is an achievement in itself. So uh, we kind of try and measure distance travelled, which is looking at a young person, seeing where they're at, and then through intervention, seeing how they are after that. So, so there's no targets then? Um, there's aims. Yeah, but, but there's not targets, is it? I don't, I, that's what I love about Snack Shack, that it's not a tick box exercise. Yeah. I don't have to engage BME young people, so black ethnic minority, you know, it's not about... Yeah. Um, but it is about anti-discriminatory practice and um, non-judgmental approach and just trying to make relationships with young people so that they can chat to me about stuff and maybe do some problem solving yeah. and uh, and see how they deal with peer pressure or bullying, exams, pressures, schools. I think the big question is, Connie, do you like them? Do I like young people? No, do you like the sort of youngsters? <laughs> yeah, I do. And have you yeah, made, they're really have, fun. Have you raised some good friends? The, the, the Year 7s have got a lot of energy and they, they were great. And in fact, when I went to school, they, they've come running up to me. So, no, I love it. It's great. It's, it's really good. Oh, that's wonderful. Connie, I want, to thank you for, I want to thank you for coming <laughs> here to talk to us. That's okay. Will you come in and talk to us again? I will do. Because we'd like to hear a lot about what the young people are doing. Yes, well, like I say, I'm four weeks in post, so I'm sure it will grow and grow. So, And hopefully some young people would... Uh, like to take part. I know that uh, my wife tells me, and you know she's engaged with the snack show, she says you've made a great hit with the kids here anyway. Excellent. Uh, well, <laughs> anyway, good luck and thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. It's Hugh Graham for Celsius Internet Radio, and I'm in the offices of Celsius Life in the High Street, and I'm talking to the editor, owner, publisher, general factotum, and chief nuisance in Celsius, Eddie Saunders. Eddie, how long have you been publishing Celsius Life for? Um, we've now just published our 150th. 150th what? Edition. Yeah. Um, so, how many years is that? 19, I think about 1993 we started. Really? Mm. So, why did you start it anyway? Um, we just felt that Celsius was growing into a town and the news that we got from the local um, observer and such um, wasn't covering Selsey. So, I can remember when I was living in Selsey at that time, that the amount of publicity or the amount of news coverage in, I think it was called The Promoter, was almost negligible. And the, uh, the, the, the local reporter who was covering Chelsea for the Judiciary Observer and the Portsmouth Easy News um, didn't seem to think that much was happening here. Uh, is that why you decided to start Chelsea Life? Yes, that's one of the main reasons. Chelsea was starting to grow quite quickly and lots of clubs and organisations uh, were springing up and we felt that, um, that we needed to sort of let everybody know what was going on. So, how many times were was it published in the first year? Uh, once, uh, 12 times. What, once a month? Yeah. Okay. Because I know that sometimes you've missed a month, haven't you? We have. At yeah. the end of the summer or Christmas or something? We have. Um, we've missed the odd ones when um, we couldn't um, get it um, published in, in that time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've missed I don't know, maybe two or three over, the, over that period of time. So, technical problems overtook you? Yeah, they do. <laughs> okay. Right, now, you have never, as far as I know, ever charged for this magazine, but I do know that you ran a sort of questionnaire, really, about a year ago, didn't you? And you asked what people would be prepared to pay for it. Well, what are people prepared to pay for it? Or what would people have been prepared to pay had you put a price on it? Well, the feedback that we've had from different people is ranges from 50p to a pound. Really? Okay, so what's not you putting a price on it then? Um, one reason was that if we put it around the shops like we do now, um, we'd have the aggro at the 
at the end of the month that uh, you know them and saying we've got three of these back, four of these guys, so that then started causing problems with um, accountancy. accountancy, which we didn't want to do. And secondly, um, all the time we can keep it free, we will. I've never actually, Eddie, thought of you as particularly philanthropic. <laughs> so my guess is that the the reason that it's it's still free is because your advertisers support you so well. Yes, it's all supported by advertising. So. Do your advertisers go by the month, or do they tend to take out a subscription for the whole year? It varies. Um, some go from month to month. Some uh, write up a contract for three months, six issues, or twelve issues. Mm -hmm. Have you got anybody advertising in the magazine that's been in every issue from the word go to now? No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, how do you reward your regular advertisers? Or do, you, do you give them particularly good, good positions? Do you give them a discount if they take a series or what? Um, yes, if they book up for three, six or twelve, then they get a, a discount on what we'd normally charge for a one-off. Okay, all right. Now, you also backed up by websites, aren't you? Yes. How many hits a month do you get on the website? Um, it tends to, at the moment, tends to be about 10,000 hits um, at the time the magazine comes out. 10,000 hits at the time the magazine comes out. Yes. Do you know how many hits the town council's website gets? No. Well, do you think it would be that many? No, I wouldn't think so, no. Really? So, and where do these hits come from? They're, they're surprising. They come from all over the world. I mean, uh, China. China? China. China surprised me. That's, that's quite a big amount of the hits. America, most of the countries in Europe. Um, but the, the China and the Far East ones that we get really surprises me. Really? So what about, so how does it get there? I mean, do people send it? Then why would anybody send a, send a copy of Celsius Life to China? I don't know, but I mean, you were talking about hits on the, on the website. So yeah. They're, so they're downloading it. Um, oh, I see, okay. On the website. But, but I do know that, uh, that uh, you've got an awful lot of readers who send their copy out to uh, their son in, in, in somewhere weird in, 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 uh, in Australia. Yes, that happens, and obviously the people that have uh, moved away to countries uh, in Europe and so forth, uh, the families tend to send them a copy so they can keep up with what's going on in Chelsea. Okay. How many copies do you publish a month? We print 4,000 copies every month, but we tend to put it up to 5,000 when the camp opens, because we get the problems from the locals moaning that they can't get one if we don't do that. Okay. Now, it's called Celsi Life. Is the circulation restricted just to Celsi? No, um, it's mainly Celsi, but we do cover the whole Mendel Peninsula. So that's in the Wittering, Burden? Yes. Okay. And Brackenshaw Bay, presumably? Yes. All right. Now, how do you distribute it? I, mean, I don't mean physically who delivers it. Do you distribute it through news agents, retail outlets, or what? And how do you decide how many each outlet gets? Um, the reason I ask this is because I have a favourite shop which I get it from. And sometimes, if I'm not fast enough, when I get there, they're all gone. Yes. Um, well, in most of the shops we go to, the people that ask us to put them in there, um, we cover a lot of shops, um, probably far too many. I mean, I've probably got about um, 30 or 40 outlets. Really? Yes. And are they, do they ever phone you up and say, where's the magazine? Um, sometimes when it's, um, the, the, the Friday falls sort of late in, you know, late, because it comes out on the first fr Friday of the month, and um, when, it, um, when it's, um, the Friday has sort of gone into the sort of second week yeah. you know, like of the month, they start sort of panicking, you know, where's my sales he lives. Okay. Now, uh, we talked about the advertising, we talked about the, the number of copies that you produce. How do you get the news? How, how do you fill the pages, the editorial pages? Um, believe it or not, 95% of the editorial is sent to us. 
from clubs, organisations. What, literally sent in the mail or by email now? Um, we've gradually got most of them over to email. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that must reduce the time bit down anyway. It does, and we get the odd one or two that it could take you hours to decipher the writings. Yeah. <laughs> and we've still got one that does that. Yeah, OK. Right, and so you, you're, you're the sort of mouthpiece for a large number of um, village organisations. Do you think of Celsius as a village or a town? Um, I think it's a large town. A lot, sorry, a large, large village. Um, okay. We've got a town council, but I don't think Celsius is a town yet. Right. Well, I'm afraid, I, I think I agree with you, actually. Um, if I want to make sure that an item about an, an event that I'm involved in needs to be publicised in advance before it occurs, how do I do that? Um, you just send your uh, text and so forth to us. So email. what's the email address? The email is uh, info at salesylife.co.uk Okay, info at salesylife.co.uk And that will automatically find you? It will find uh, the wife who does all the... Uh, oh, that's Jill. That's Jill, yeah. yeah. So you couldn't work without Jill? Um, I would struggle, I would struggle to do it on my own, yes. Okay. Eddie, well, I want to thank you very much for talking to me, but looking forward, do you see that you'll still be doing this in 15 years' time? I'd like to think so, but uh, age gets the better of you. So it's a hundred, so, you're, so we could actually be talking to you again on the 300th issue. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it might be true. If I get round with me walking stick by then, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have regular contributors now? We do, yes. All right. So who's the favourite uh, regular contributor you've got? Probably the, the, the two people um, that send in the history of Selsey. Yeah. Um, I've learnt a lot about Selsey from um, people like Ruth Mariner, yeah. uh, who send us you know, the pieces about history. Yeah. Okay. When's the ne when will the next issue be out? Is it, uh, is it always out in the first week of the first month? It's, we get it out on the first Friday in the month. First Friday in the month. Okay. So, I'm going to send you a piece about Celsius Internet Radio. Will you put it in for me? Well, I'll give it some thought. Thanks a lot, Eddie. And congratulations on the 150th anniversary issue. I'm in Tuppenies Rice in Chelsea High Street and I'm talking to Lynn Reeve who was the genius who thought up Tuppenies Rice right? and we're going to run a series of uh, little programmes between now and Christmas called Lynn's Larder and Lynn's going to help us uh, make delicacies really for Christmas and she's going to start with I think she said she told me she's going to start with pickled onions which I guess are my favourite with a decent piece of cheddar cheese. So, Lynn, can you, can anybody who listens to your recipes actually come into Tutney Rice and pick up a recipe sheet? They certainly can, yeah. And we're going to start very simply with pickled onions because it's time to get them ready for Christmas, you. Okay. <coughs> well, I love pickled onions and I like them with cheddar and I like them with... Uh, with, with Stilton too, oh, so, yes. yeah. Yes. But I don't like them when they're soggy, I like them when they're crisp and crunchy. Yeah, okay. So I hope you're going to teach us how to do crisp and crunchy You know, this. one of the most important things, of course, is the jars that you put them in. If your really? jars aren't, aren't sterilised properly, then your, your goods aren't going to be up to standard, are they? So you've got to make sure that your jars are perfectly clean and sterilised. There's a couple of ways to do this. Okay, well, how are they? Okay. Um, one of them, my favourite method, really, is to put them in the oven. So you heat the oven up to about 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. That's um, 130 degrees Celsius. And don't be tempted to heat it any higher than that. Don't let the oven go any higher than that because you want a really nice low temperature. And you just lay a double layer of newspaper onto the racks in the oven. Newspaper? Newspaper's good. Really? Yeah, really good. And put the jars on the top of the newspaper. Close the oven door. Uh, door. Make sure the jars aren't touching each other. Close right. the oven door and wait a minimum of 20 minutes. That's a minimum. You okay. can go longer. You don't want to put them in there for hours and hours on end. 20 yeah. minutes is quite sufficient to sterilise your and jars. And that kills all the bugs. And that kills all the bugs and everything else. And you need to use your jars whilst they're warm. Okay. All right? So that 
it's 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 a good way of doing it don't add cold food to hot jars and don't add hot food to cold jars otherwise right? it works, correct. yes that's yeah. right and it can be quite a dangerous thing to do yeah. i'm going to repeat that don't add hot food to cold jars and don't add cold juice ju- cold food to cold juice to p- hot food you know what i'm saying don't you yeah. yeah it's just really really important the glass can crack and it can be quite dangerous okay the dishwasher method is very good if you've got a high temperature setting on your dishwasher that can be quite good um, or some people have even got a steam dishwasher today which is even better you fill your dishwasher with the clean cold jars and run a minimum of rinse time to, to time the ending with when your jam preserve or pickle will be ready all okay. right so as soon as the jars come out of the oven you can get them packed up all right You can do them in the microwave, but of course you can't get many jars in a microwave and it's a rather, if you're doing 10, 12 at a time, it can be a rather lengthy way of doing it. And you need to microwave the jars when they're a little wet. You leave them just a little bit wet and microwave them for 30 to 45 seconds, all right, depending on the size of the jar. Don't use any old jam lids, all right? Just please don't use old jam lids. You don't know what's on them. You can't sterilize them properly. Just discard any old jam lids and use the wax discs and the cellophane discs that you can buy in most good jam jar shops, <laughs> in most okay. good all cooking right. shops, all right? So we're going to start with some pickled onions. Now I'm not giving you any amounts for pickled onions because the amount you want to do will depend on the jars you've got and the amount you can carry home from the green grocers in the high street in Selsey, okay. all right? So we're going to get start with your onions and we're going to peel them. Now peeling onions can be a real core. So just you just got to bear with it really i always do mine under running cold water bit of a waste of water but it does stop your eyes from running if the onions are a bit strong it also stops your hands from staining too badly you ladies out there put some gloves on because onions are the worst thing in the world for staining your fingers they're really awful um my granny used to do this outside in the garden ah. and she swore that if you did it outside yeah and you weren't in a confined space all the uh your stinging eyes disappear. Mm. And I found that to be true. Mm. I think that works well for some people. I think some people have got quite sensitive eyes, haven't they? And uh, um, I know my eyes are quite sensitive, so anywhere I am, the onions are going to sting my eyes. I always put my goggles on. (laughs) Not swimming goggles. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, you're going to peel your onions, all right? And then you're going to put them in your big bowl or whatever you've got and layer salt over the top. Salt. Salt over the top. One layer of salt one over, layer over, over the one salt. layer of onion? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So you're going to salt them overnight then. You're going to leave them there overnight and just let them salt. So you don't put any fluid on no, them? No, nothing at all. Just salt just on the top onions, of the onions? Just salt on top of the onions. Any particular salt? Just table salt? And just table salt's fine. Okay, yeah, fine, table salt's right. fine. We want one litre of van vinegar, Right. two cups of sugar, and then we want some pimento, some cloves, and some peppercorns. Right. Right. You're going to boil the pimento, the cloves, and the peppercorns up in the vinegar. Boil it. Boil it. Okay. All yeah. right. A lot of people just heat it up gently. No, you yeah. need to boil this up in the so that you get a good flavour going there. Rinse the onions and dry them. So you're going to rinse all the salt off of the onions and dry them off. Yeah. And then you pack the onions in the sterilised jars and pour your vinegar in. Okay. Okay. Seal them up and leave them till Christmas, and they'll be gorgeous. I promise you. Nice bit of cheese. Nice bit of crusty bread, and you're on your way. Yeah, you need some decent butter too, right? Oh, you need some decent butter. You've got to have butter, can't you? Yeah. No spreads, eh? No spreads, just no, butter. No, no, just butter. Yeah, crusty okay. butter. So, let's recap then. Any amount of onions, depending on the size of the jars. Yeah. And how many, and how many onions you've got. Uh, do you recommend any particular onions? No. You can buy any, any, any pickling onions you want to get from the local greengrocer. I'm going to get Doesn't mine from John at the top of West Street. John at the top of West Street is very good. Yeah, and yeah. I think I buy them by the small sack. Uh-huh. And that's a, it means that I've got enough onions because when I, when I do my pickled onions, and I, it's very similar to, what, um, to the way that you just suggested, uh, I find that you have to make more than you think you need because your family discovers that you've got them. And once that happens, my family arrived like a plague of locusts as they take all the onions away. I think, you it's because you break into the jars before Christmas yourself, because I know your love of pickled onions, all right? And I think it's because you go into the jars and pinch them okay. one at a time. But I promise you that if you leave them from now to Christmas, they actually only need about four weeks. Yeah. But any time after four weeks is fine. But if you leave them from now to Christmas, you'll get a really nice, tasty onion. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much, Liz. You're welcome. What are we going to do next week? Well, I thought next week we'd go on to some plum pudding. Oh, wonderful. All right. A, big, a good old Victorian plum pudding, I think. That would okay. be a good one, won't, don't you? That would be wonderful, It'd be Liz. quite a boozy one, but for you, those of you out there that don't want to, you don't have to put the alcohol in. OK, Liz. Well, look, thanks very much. I'll You're look welcome. forward to talking to you next week. OK, thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Now it's time for Ellis Berg, and he's reading two poems, one about an amateur dramatics, the other about auditions. So if it's your ambition to one day tread the boards, you'll love Ellis's poems. Over to you, Ellis. There's always been one or more performing groups in Selsey. We all know Cloud Nine, Sue Graves runs, gives us the end of the pier show then there's the operatic society SECOS and there have been several amateur dramatic groups there was the Selsey Players oh ever such a long time ago this was followed by Scamps and that was followed by Playbill and at the same time there was this tiny group called the Manhood Players and just recently we have the Prima Donnas, who put on Murder Mysteries. And this little poem is dedicated to all the producers and directors of, and writers, and especially to Thea Foote, who is a writer, producer and director of quite a lot of stuff that we've done. Here it is. It's just simply called Amdram. There really should be no delay in putting on the village play, and unfortunately there's a snag in getting it into the bag. All is well until the catch comes up in making bookings match. You only want the hall to be kept free for your society, but slimming classes, judo classes are more important than your farces. Then the office finds some spaces. You all say thanks with smiling faces. But members of the cast will shriek, but I'm on holiday that week. Director fight back, fights back, bitter tear. Will anyone at all be here? We've got a strong and able cast. The parts are really not that fast. Of doubts I've never really had any since we ditched that bitch Evadony. So go away and learn a line. I hate to hear directors whine. Suddenly the skies are clear. Director, it's the office here. Recently we've had some calls. You've got a choice between two halls. The tutor of the slimming group takes part in your dramatic gr- troupe, and this will make you yell, Oh, good o! Your set designer runs the judo. Director calls dramatic team and cries, Troops, it's time to get up steam. Wardrobe, gather up the drag. Wigs, you've got them in the bag. Make up, where the hell's that chap? Has he got the Leishner slap? That's a lovely poster, dear. You've got my name so bright and clear. The programme's nearly done, you say? Well, see the advertisers pay. Has anybody thought to snaffle prizes for the half-time raffle? I've sent the ads in where I should, sent tickets to the great and good, especially my pet reviewer, for his write-ups always (laughs) pure. Now, look. I've done the setting model. You'll find the scenery's a doddle. Now someone tell me where is props? She's trailing through the Oxfam shops. SM, have you seen our lighting? This is getting quite exciting. The tech and dress is on our heels. We'll see what horror that reveals. The prompts in place, the call boys there, the backstage crew are all aware. The barman never thought he'd shove his way into a bunch of loveys. Front of house exude their charm and pass the code for far alarm. Audio has got it right. 
The audience is sitting tight, and then our little hearts aglow. Another opening, another show. Last time I talked about our performing arts companies in Selsey. And there's one thing all the members of these societies know, and that's auditions. Auditions where you are chosen to be part of the company that performs. Uh, sometimes these auditions are held in front of the whole company. But very often they're quite private, just the committee and the director. And I've written <laughs> some sonnets, two sonnets. Uh, uh, one is called The Amateur Artiste. That's all of us. And the other one's called the amateur director. Well, very often they are professionals. Anyway, here they are. The artiste. Auditions are, for me, a sheer delight to show my talents to the cognoscente. Of music, dance and acting I have plenty, but dazzling stage directors with my might. Of course, there are the ones who strut and puff, who think they know the music, but they don't, who expect to get the part, but then they won't. Their patience tried who listened to such stuff. The panel heard my piece, the song, the lib. I even wore the hero's hat and scarf. I wonder, do they think that I was glib? Perhaps they'd say, he did it for a laugh. If all goes wrong, I really shouldn't crib. Give my scepter for a palmer's walking staff. And those of you, yeah, I expect most of you know that bit comes from Richard II Shakespeare. Uh, and here's the amateur director who finishes us up with a bit of mangled Shakespeare. I know this one. He's knocking on a bit, but I won't have to tell him what to do. And then I'll have the time to teach the new, the youngsters, everyone in need of it. He's learnt it well. No reading from the book. The singing's right, dispensing with the score. And I don't hope for dancing any more, so that lets this old fellow off the hook. That hat and scarf's a shock. What is he doing? He hasn't any need to spin my viewing. I know what he can do. Yes, he's a trooper. Perhaps he thinks he'll finish as a super. He needn't fret, because he'll fill the bill. Divinity that shapes our ends, rough you them as we will. <laughs> Thank you, Ellis. Now let's go over to Giles Pear, who is talking to Hugh Graham about what needs to be done in the October Garden. Well... Uh, I know very little about gardening, and so Giles is very kind. G Giles Peer, uh, a well-known local broadcaster, who's won the award for the best gardening broadcaster in England several times, has agreed to come and give us gardening tips for Celsius Internet Radio. So I'm talking to Giles today, and said, "And Giles, I know really very little about gardening. So what should we be doing in October?" Well, uh, you know, October is a very, very uh, good month for uh, the garden, uh, colour-wise, especially not just in the garden, in the countryside. It's very, all the leaves are in there, uh, you know, beautiful colours, bronze and all the deep reds, and it's really very beautiful in the garden and in the country. And also, we can get what I call the odd balmy sunshine day, which yeah. we had not long ago, which can be very nice, but then that can be followed by... Uh, wet and gloomy weather but uh, we're one uh, pressing on um, in the garden itself in first this time of year in in the garden one would tend to um, have a look at uh, and think about replacing the summer bedding which is in containers boxes window boxes in even in the borders wherever you've got it it'll be getting to well towards the end now and then replacing it with winter winter flowering uh, Flowers such as um, such as oh, pansies, violas, uh, mini heathers, and primroses, and also 
some uh, mini uh, conifers. Mini conifers can look really nice. Uh, so would you have raised those yourself, or would you? Have no, them? I would go. I would not raise them myself. Not all that lot. No, I would personally advise people to get them from a well-known or re reputable nursery because there are plenty around this area, as okay, you know. Yeah, fine. So I would. I, I mean, if people want to grow their own, fine, but. I'd more for certainly for mini conifers and that sort of thing and heathers you're better off to uh, buy from a really good nursery. Local nursery. Yeah, and there are a lot, as I say, around here. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing this time is very important to put uh, netting on ponds because leaves are coming down or starting to come down quite heavily, and obviously you want to keep, you don't want all the leaves falling in the pond. So get netting on any ponds if you've got a garden so pond. So you put netting on the ponds to stop the leaves going in. To either prevent you clearing them out, or do they, or, or do the leaves contaminate the water? Yeah, they do indeed. Yeah, they they take away a lot of oxygen and cause a lot of mess in the bottom of the pond. Yeah. So if you've got fish in there, it could be dangerous. They, they wouldn't do them any good at all. Not okay. at all. So it's. Very, so what sort of netting? Oh, just very light so, nut netting. You get it from again from any good garden centre. It's uh, usually a light kind of greenish netting, uh, light netting, and then you. Oh, can, so there's sort of plastic nylon stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then you can shake it every so often, obviously, to uh, get rid of the leaves. Otherwise, it'll sink back. It'll sink down Surely. too much. Okay. That's a really good idea. Um, and also, the net would keep herons away too. Oh uh, yeah, it does help. Yeah, yeah, it does help. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's not foolproof on that one. <laughs> but it helps. It helps certainly. Yeah, it does okay. help. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think the other main thing this. Uh, week really is to lift and store gladioli bulbs. Um, so how do you actually do that? Uh, just take them out of the ground, the cut are cut off because they'll have all, most of them will have died by now, cut the the main foliage off, uh, take them out of the ground, uh, shake them off, dry them out and put them in a cool a cool storage place. What, in a shed? Winter. Yeah, in a shed, so yeah, yeah. And do you rest them on straw or grass? Or? Uh, no, just put them in, in a tray or whatever, so, you know, you don't need to rest them on anything particularly, I say make sure they're dry before you put them in there. Okay, so... And are, are, they sub are, are they susceptible to frost? No, yeah, they would be if you left. Yeah, yeah, you're better off to put them in a, a say, frost-free shed. Yeah. Okay. So would you would you put them? Uh, would you wrap them perhaps in sacking? No, the I wouldn't bother. No, wouldn't I bother. wouldn't bother. No, okay. no, I'd, I'd just put them in a say in a, in a most shades are pretty. You know, they're not. You, they they can suffer quite a bit of cold. Okay. So I wouldn't right. worry too much about that. A little saying I, I like to mention: it's always wise to keep your words soft and sweet you never know when you will have to eat them <laughs> uh, i think that's very applicable especially to gardeners yeah. and um, my tip for this week is uh, if you're out and about in the countryside there's a lot of late honeysuckle flowering in the edges uh, go out it's quite it, beautiful too isn't it? it is and it's got a lovely perfume yeah and go out just late in, in the late evening before it gets dark they could inhale it deeply and a few times and it will have an aphrodisiac effect really <laughs> so, have you tried that uh, i'm not going down that road but it, it does, <laughs> i'm sure i'm assured it does work okay <laughs> if well, anyone wants to try it <laughs> thanks a lot john right so we'll, we'll, we'll be having you back next week yeah that's what are we going good. to be talking about next week uh well a few things well i want to talk about picking uh, fruit from the edges etc and I also want to talk about um, mowing the grass, and that's about they're the main issues, really. Okay, John. Well, I look forward to seeing you next, next week. week. Yeah. Okay. Cheerio bye now. And now it's time for what's on in Selsey. Selsey Horticultural Society are having their next meeting on Friday, the 11th of October, at 7:30 p.m. at the Selsey Centre. The topic is Gardens of the World and Diving Holidays by Ted and Sue Clamp. New members and visitors are always welcome. Membership is £7 a year. Visitors are a pound per meeting. The Venture Bus is available for lifts. So if you need a lift, telephone 605 115 to book a place. For further details on the night, contact Linda Brown on 601 483. Also this week, Selsey Business Partnership are having a grand quiz night at the Royal British Legion Club. It's on Thursday the 10th of October, 7pm for a 7.30 start. Teams of 6 to 8 are very welcome. So take along a team and win one of their cash prizes. 
A basket meal is available if required. Please order on your arrival. And the quiz master for the night is Mr Tim Lawson. Now I know it's not on the Manor Peninsula or in Selsey, but if you are following the Great British Bake Off, you might be interested to know that West End Gardens near Chichester are hosting a Grow, Cook and Eat day. Well actually it's two days, October the 5th and 6th, and that's 10.30 to 5pm. There'll be cooking workshops for the whole family with Mary Berry. There will also be food identification sessions, children's activities and live music from Eddie Reader, Jamie Lawson and Hat Full of Rain. So if you're interested in that, give them a ring at West End Gardens for more information. Now let's not forget, Selsey Fireworks are celebrating their 35th year. The display is held on Saturday the 12th of October at Bun Leisure Whitehorse Plainfield, just off Warners Lane, Selsey. The route is well signposted and the gates and funfair will open at 5.30, live music from 6.30, bonfire at 7.45 and the fireworks will begin from about 8.30. This year's theme is Around the World in 80 Days and is a dramatic colour coordinated display to music associated with films. Entrance on the gate is £4 per child and £5 per adult and children must be accompanied by an adult. So get yourselves down there and have a good time and hope it doesn't rain. Right, in next week's podcast, Kylie Scott will be telling us more about her work with the Selsey Youngsters. Lynn Reeve will be cooking up some lovely Christmas delicacies and we will be finding out about who lights up the high street every Christmas in Selsey. Giles will be back giving us more tips for the October garden. And finally, Selsey Internet Radio would appreciate your feedback. We are a community podcast, so we want to include the items that you want to hear. So suggestions are always welcome. You can contact us via Facebook, or you can write your ideas down and drop them into the Selsey Information Exchange in Penny Lane Arcade. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's show and that you will join us again next time. So, until then, goodbye.